to the Whirlpool Duet Washer, and uh, I know some of you guys had the chance to be part, part of it, but um, I went over the board and some of the other components. I want to go over the rest of the washer today. Um, something simple, the drain pump. So look at the drain pump and a circulation pump on this schematic down here. Um, they do have um, two separate paths, but let's take a look. Let me, let me screenshot this and bring it over to my drawing tool just so I can explain something here. Um, part of troubleshooting is not just knowing how to read the diagram, but knowing, like, if it's in a specific circuit, um, you know, why, why do they do that circuit specific way, and then how do we test it? So let me just put this diagram here for a second. So here's the diagram. They call this a strip circuit. This isn't the whole machine diagram. The whole machine diagram, um, I'll go back to the first page here, it is, is this mess here. And this is the whole wiring diagram. And, and one thing you can see we talked about is everything on this machine connects directly to the board, whether it's 120 volts or it's low voltage. Um, they're all going to be connected to the board and all these connectors here. So if we look at this drain pump here, that the drain pump and the circulation pump, notice it goes to J112, J113, J111, J114. All of the pumps are on the same plug. And the drain pump, they put two blue wires. And the circulation pump, they put two red wires. Um, so let's just say we turn the washer on, it fills with water, and now we want to recirculate. What does a recirculation pump do in the washing machine? What is its function? Anybody know what, what, the, what the recirculation pump does? I mean, obviously it recirculates the water, but what does it physically do? Why do we have a circulation pump in the first place? Not a lot of machines circulate the water. They just wash the clothes in a tub of water. What, what are the benefits of recirculation? I'm guessing the same thing. Go ahead. Uh, Peter first. Go ahead, Peter. I'm just guessing maybe it saves a way of saving water. No, it don't really save much water. It's going to fill up with the same amount of water. Uh, I'll go over that in a second. Yeah, Jonas, what were you saying? I said it's just secreting the water like the drain pump, whatever. It's just like, uh, I guess, uh, need the uh, water that um, is draining, it doesn't burn the pump out. Yeah, uh, so we got a drain pump to pump the water out of the machine. The recirculation pump is during the wash cycle. And sometimes this pump is used to circulate the water back up to the dispenser to take fabric softener or bleach or detergent as the machine's washing, the pump will pump water back up to the compartment and that compartment will help wash the detergent or the bleach out. Now some of these machines, and I'm gonna show it on this diagram, they have a separate pump just for the dispenser on some models. Now most machines when they dispense, they use the water valve and you got a hot and a cold water valve like any other washer, but then they got another bundle of valves. And one is for bleach, one is for fabric softener, one is for uh, detergent. Um, the circulation pump can do the same thing. The machine will fill with water, and while it's washing, the circulation pump can circulate that water back up to the dispenser and wash out anything in the dispenser. Now, what a lot of people don't know is when the machine's filling with water or dispensing, um, a lot of manufacturers try to run the water over the glass door so that the customer can see inside that doesn't build up with soap and dirt. That's just a, a, a little caveat thing that, you know, little things you need to know. Um, the drain pump is only to take the water at the end of the cycle. But I highlighted the circuit for the circulation pump. I'm going to highlight in a different color and a different size uh, pen. This is the path for the drain pump. Now, the reason why I'm pointing that out is because when you're troubleshooting, you know, I don't want anybody to go into a machine 
and say, okay, it's not draining. I'm going to go check the pump. I'm going to tear the whole machine apart, go down to that pump, and I'm going to check that pump and see if that pump's good. Yeah, but we can check the pump from the board. But before I even make any tests, notice that I got two different circuits highlighted, one in yellow and the other one in the light blue. Okay? What can you tell me if you go to a customer's home and the customer says, uh, my drain pump's not draining the water. So you're going to turn the machine on and you put it in a wash cycle first to fill up and you see it circulating the water across the glass door. You know it's not the water valve calling for water because the machine has already filled up and it's already agitating and the circulation pump is working. Can we use that knowledge to help us troubleshoot the machine? And how would we use it? I would say yes, um, because um, out of two things you might think, um, it's already eliminated one of them. So now we just like um, your focus um, should be like um, toward more like um, the train pump. Because if it circulates the water, though, you know, that means it works. Right? Yes. Uh, and I think you're correct. But what I was trying to get at is if we look at both of these pumps, both of them require the main relay to be functioning, right? And if the recirculation pump is working, what does that mean about my main relay? It's good or bad? It's good. It's working. Okay. That's correct. Now, the drain pump also uses that relay, but if my drain pump's not working, well, there's only how many things left that could possibly be a problem? Um, I would say two things. That's correct. They would be what? One would be um, the drain pump. It's, uh, it's uh, not as bad. Okay. And what else? That means that... Like, it kind of like um, we save power, but I mean, it doesn't drain. Well, and the second, it may not be getting power, right? That's that's a possibility as well. And what would cause that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's honestly, even though it's grounded, it could still receive power. So um, I'm not too sure there. Look what I highlighted. I circled on the board. The drain relay. Uh, so, but yes, they are in the same circuit, right? Uh, no, the circulation pump goes through its own relay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. The so, relay on the on the um, on G um, is that J J J two or J eleven might be bad though. It's between J eleven one and J two two. Exactly. Yes. So okay, so think about this and, th and this is what I'm, I'm trying to emphasize today the hardest part about fixing an appliance is not going over there see it leak water you look underneath the pump strip of water okay I need a new pump I'm gonna go ahead and change the pump the hardest thing about troubleshooting is walking up to an appliance knowing that it's not working but then you say okay where do I begin testing like what do I do first what do I do second? You know, like, is there an order? And what I'm trying to show you is, is the order. The first thing we did is we looked at the diagram itself and we saw the circuit, which I highlighted again in, in this, this color here. Uh, I uh, looked for the circuit of the drain pump. I wanted to know, okay, the customer states the washer is not draining. I want to know how does that drain pump get power? And according to the schematic here, it's got two relays and the pump itself, one of those could be bad. So the next thing I did is I looked at the circulation pump and said, wow, the circulation pump and the drain pump, they do use a similar path at right here. They change on the other side over here, but coming in line one, they both use the main relay. And if the circulation pump is working, I'm not worried about that relay. I've already, before I put a meter on it, I don't need to test it because I know it's a functional part. A relay is not going to work in one cycle and not work in another cycle. It's going to be separate. So 
Now the thing is, is okay, let me erase the overlapping circuit, the yellow. And by erasing that, what I have left is the part of the circuit I need to troubleshoot. So I haven't put a meter on the machine. I just looked at the diagram. I looked at what components were working. The drain pump wasn't. The circulation pump was. I looked at how power flowed through that diagram for each part. Then I said, oh, I can eliminate this relay, uh, this relay here because this pump is working. So now it's either the drain pump or the drain relay. So now we have to make our plan of attack. What test do you think would be the next test as well as the easiest test to make? What test would you make next? I would say resistance because it's had the resistance values right on there. Well, Mike, we don't like to use resistance a lot because what if the drain pump had a sock or underwear or something caught in it? So you take an Ohm's test of the pump and you say, oh, well, according to the in in information here, it's 18 to 21 ohms. I got 19 ohms. It's good. I'm going to order a board. That's not accurate, though, because I would, it could be mechanical. Yes. I, the second test I'll do is just like um, check to see if there is continuity from one to the next or check to see if you want 20 get into the pump. 120 is the answer. Hold on a second. I'm, I'm going to grab my meter leads from this uh, uh, this screen and, and, and bring them over to the next screen. Hold on a second. So now I got my meter leads. Voltage is the best way to test. Great. I got guys cutting my lawn right now making a noise while I'm recording. Uh, voltage is the best way to test. Where would you make that voltage test? J112 to J111. Very good. So you're going to put one meter lead on J112 and one on J111. Now, am I going to have power there all the time? No. No. So what do I need to do to assure that I have power because if you are running the washing machine, the drain pump doesn't run until the end of the cycle. The drain pump is not going to run all the time. So we need to, one, if we're going to check voltage to the drain pump, we need to know that the machine itself should be setting power at that time. So what needs to be done in order to make that voltage test? It will have to be running. You have to be running, but you have to be running in diagnostics. Um, let me open up the uh, PDF here. So if you look here, test number eight is the drain recirculation test. Check for obstruction usual areas, check drain pump here. Um, visually check the connectors are okay. I mean, that's just something you do for everything. Remove with an ohm meter measure resistance. This is a waste of time. Measuring resistance tells you you got ohms on a pump. I don't know, how many pumps have you guys changed? A few? A lot? A little? Quite a few. Okay. And ones that had their own motor, what do you think went wrong with that pump? The, the winding in the motor burned out? Most likely, and, and it usually like the impeller, it's just like, um, just like in bad. It cannot, doesn't have any resistance to pump the water out most of the time for me. Uh, it's very rare that I've seen a pump like this lose its ohms. It, it can happen. But those types of pumps and motors, I've seen like something magnetically goes wrong with the pump. And if you try to rotate it, it turns like a quarter turn. And then it gets hard, and it turns a quarter turn, gets hard. And if you run it with power outside of the machine, you see the impeller like rock back and forth because it can't rotate. So you could have something stuck in the pump. You could have something mechanically wrong with the pump. 
But checking ohms is not going to tell you that. What you need to do is go back to the pump See if I have voltage at these two points on the pump. And if I have voltage and the pump doesn't work, I could at that point tell the customer we're going to order a pump. But it would probably be better for me, especially if I'm doing a COD call, I'm going to go down and check to make sure that there's nothing blocked in there. So what would you do after you check for voltage? Uh, would you go straight down to the pump and um, just start taking the machine apart to check it? What things can we do before we tear the machine apart? If you have voltage there, we can go into the pump, it doesn't work. So probably the pump could get to a point it's trying to run, but if there's a barbie pen, pen in there, it would not run. So therefore, you would have to take the wire, um, I believe, um, like you said earlier, if you check on um, uh, resistor on it, it's not going to do anything. So I would check to see if there is not a instruction that stop um, the impeller to just turn. Okay. Well, yeah, the checking restriction is important, but I want to do something more before I go down to the machine and take it apart. How about taking a small wet dry vacuum, take the drain hose out of the pipe, out of the wall, and connect the two hoses together, your vacuum to the drain hose of the washer. Because if there's something like a sock or underwear caught in the pump, and you try to use a vacuum on it, it's going to restrict sucking that water out. Now, water may come, but it's going to be hard for it to come out. Now, if there's no obstruction at all, you're going to suck the water out of the pump, and that's something that you would probably want to do before you open the machine anyways, because if you take the machine open and the drain pump's not working, it's probably filled with water. And then when you want to go check inside the pump for something, if it, the machine's filled with water, it's not going to uh, be any good. You're going to flood the house if you, if you don't take care of it. Have you guys ever heard of hose pinch-off pliers? No. For me. I'm going to show you guys a tool, hose pinch off pliers. Look at these tools right here. I've worked on a lot of Frigidaire product. My company is Factory Authorizer Frigidaire. And one year, they notified me and told me, hey, man, um, we have a rework. We need you to replace the drain pumps in all these units. And I was doing apartment complexes and, and some of their commercial stuff. So they sent me over a hundred drain pumps and I had to go apartment by apartment changing drain pumps. Now the thing is, is when you go apartment by apartment, it's not that hard to change a drain pump on a stack unit. You just take that front panel off and the pump's right there in the corner. But there's always going to be some water in the machine. You can take a vacuum and try to suck the water out with a vacuum, but that may not work too well, especially if it's in a closet and you can't get to the drain hose. So these pinch-off pliers here, um, they go between the washing machine tub and the drain pump, and they squeeze the hose. And in doing so, you can remove the hose and the drain pump and replace the drain pump with the machine with a full tub of water. Now, I recommend you have two of those pliers and not just one. Um, so that way, if one happens to slip, it doesn't slip while you're changing the pump and all the water comes rushing out. But these pinch-off pliers make it easier for you to take the pump off while the machine's full of water. You don't have to drain it. So they are definitely a, a must for someone's toolbox, and they're not that expensive. Now, they have some, you want to, when you purchase them, you want to make sure that they have long enough jaws because some of these front-load washers the drain hose is pretty big. Now they make them like this one right here. If you can see the, the length of these jaws here are longer than some of the others. If you don't have the right length, you won't pinch off the hose completely and it'll leak water when you're doing it. So that's just a tool that I wanted to bring to your attention. So the drain pump, if I have voltage here, the problem is at the pump. I just want to confirm now it's not any obstructions. And then if there's no obstructions, then obviously I have to change the drain pump. 
What if I don't have voltage at J11 and J2 with the same problem that we had? What would you do? Change the board. Because if I don't have voltage, I know my main relay is good because my circulation pump's going. I don't have voltage here. In order to do it, I go into diagnostics, and during diagnostics, I'm going to go to the step that tells the drain pump to run. At that point, I'll make this voltage test. If I have zero volts at these two points, I could move my meter to see if I have voltage here, but I'm not going to waste my time because I know the circulation pump is and I have voltage here. So my problem is this drain relay, and I'm just going to change the board. So any questions on the, on the circulation pump or the drain pump and how to test it? All right, so let's get to the heating element. Heating elements used to raise the water temperature inside the machine higher than the house water temperature. It's used for sandy wash or uh, even the clean cycle in the washer. They heat it up really hot to try to help clean. But one of the most important things about the sandy wash is that the sandy wash, um, it will like right now with everybody with COVID and all these different colds and stuff, Okay, give me a second. There's a lot more guys driving around. Okay, um, it's supposed to reduce germs. Okay, yes, using bleach will help, but also hot water helps out a lot besides getting out stains. So if we look at this heating element, we got two relays here. We got a main relay and a heater relay, and then we got this neutral heater relay. So we got a relay on both sides of the heating element. So just as, as simple as the drain pump, if I wanted to check this heating element out, what do I do? What's the steps? Just like any other, just like the drain pump, what, what are the steps that we gotta go to? We go to the customer's machine, they're gonna state, my heater's not working? What, what, what are they going to tell you? You're going to put the machine to diagnosis. Okay. And then you check um, to see if you have um, a 120 going to that um, heater. Okay. So let's just uh, screenshot this one here and take it to the other diagram. We won't spend a lot of time on this. Just I want to go over some more complicated stuff, but let's move this one up. I'll put this diagram here. So we're going to do just like we did with the drain pump. Uh, let me just put this to the back. So we're going to check here and here for voltage. If I have voltage and the heater is not working, I'm not going to waste my time with ohms. One thing we have to be careful, and the same thing with the drain pump, I didn't say it. If a wire is broken or frayed or cut, and we have voltage there, and I go and change the pump, and it still don't work. We need to make sure that the wires are there. Um, so if we do this heating element, we want to go to diagnostics. If I have voltage, this is where an ohms test would be good on the drain pump as well as the heating element. Let's say I go to the customer's house, and I'm going to go back to the drain pump for a second, I go to the heater, and I say, hey, I have voltage here and here. That tells me my relays are working. My drain pump is not. My drain pump's bad. Yes and no. What if I got a broken wire? I can also do an ohms test from here and here, and I'm looking for 18 to 21 ohms, but there's a problem. If the wire is broke, am I going to get an ohm reading? No. No, you won't. If the pump is open, am I going to get an ohm reading? Nope. No, no, so. So an ohms test from here doesn't tell me my problem is my pump or problems are my wires. So if, if I was here, I'd be a betting man <clears throat> and say it's a bad drain pump because wires very rarely break even though it does happen. But before I install the drain pump, could I go down to the machine, put in diagnostics, force that drain pump to get power, and go right to the pump itself for power? 
say, yeah, I got 110, I'm going to change the pump. No, I don't have it. One of my blue wires are bad. You can do that or maybe use a cheater cord, just like bypass it and just see if the pump going to pump. Yeah, you could do that too. A cheater cord's good too. And that's the same thing with the heating element. If I go here and I got 120 going to my element at J32 and J31, that's good. But, again, I could be a wire or an element's bag. Now, with this heating element, let me uh, bring up this other page. With the heating element, it has a, a thermistor right here, wash temperature sensor. So, the sensor's there to tell the control board what the temperature of the water is. And it's based on resistance. If you look here, in this chart up here at the top, it's telling you if it's 140, I don't know what's, what that 60 is. Hold on one second. That I've never seen. I, 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 I'm stumped. You guys see this chart? Okay, I get it now. So if we're looking at approximate resistance of 4.9 first of all that's in the thousands of ohms okay and if we look here on uh, the temperature we have 140 and 60 I just realized what do you think the two temperatures are they can't be both they can't be 60 or 40 can it That's Fahrenheit and Celsius. I think at 60 degrees um, Celsius, let me see something. 60 degrees. Yep, 60 degrees Celsius is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you guys look at that, let me move this over here. If you look at it, 60 degrees Celsius is 140. So they, they didn't put it here. They put it on this chart here, the Fahrenheit and Celsius, and the kilo ohms. That should have been on the top of this chart. They didn't put it in the chart. So this is Fahrenheit, and this is Celsius temperatures. So this sensor, um, if you look, we can ohm out the sensor. We'd like to ohm it out at room temperature. If you look, they're telling you here 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius is 20,000 ohms. Now we're looking for a rough ballpark figure, so we can do that from the board here. If the sensor is not reading the right temperature, we'll let the heater come on. No, you want to tweak. Okay. It's depending on what the actual problem with it is. If it's shorted or something, it might not let the, the, the machine go through a cycle. If the resistance value is off, in other words, it's 20,000 ohms at 77 degrees. And if you look here, here's 77 and 20,000. But what if I'm getting 197,000 at 77 degrees? It's not going to let the heating element come on. It thinks the element's temperature is hotter or colder than it should be. So we can ohm it out, but we're looking for this in a ballpark of 20,000. What if it's 22,000? Eh, it might not be exactly 77 degrees. But the other thing is, can we check voltage on this sensor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let me just screenshot and take it to the other page here real quick. Now remember, every single one of these items I said in the beginning can be tested from the board. So let me just put this one here. Uh, send back. So let me bring this to the front. So I would check here on this board what voltage am I testing it? Are my meters correct? My meter leads to make that test. The meter leads are correct, and um, 
I would just check for 120. Not 120. Look at that diamond. Oh, no, no. 5 BDC, my bad. 5 BDC. Okay, so going back to my question, are my meter leads correct? No, the red has to be on the uh, J15-1, and the black has to be on J15-3. Why? Because the voltage. <laughs> I remember from yeah, last time. Yeah, because you've got a plus and a minus. With an analog meter, it's very important that you have your meter leads on the right points. On a digital meter, if you put them on wrong, it'll just show minus 5 volts DC instead of 5 volts DC. So digital meters are a little more forgiving and let you know that whether or not the board's sending power. So if the board's sending power 5 volts and you get about 20,000 ohms, everything there should be working. If my heater's not working, my sensor is not the problem. We have to go back to the heater circuit. So there's a lot of thermistors and appliances and a lot of people, they go and something's not working, uh, even my techs. They order every thermistor in the entire refrigerator when, when it's when it's got a problem. Does it need every thermistor? No. You just need to know what thermistor is the problem so you can troubleshoot it. But you got to know what each thermistor function is. And this sensor is to sense whether the machine's filling with the right water or not. So I'm, I'm not going to waste much more time on that sensor. It's just here. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. This is just a dispenser that uses the water valves to, to dis dispense detergent, bleach, and softener. This machine here has pumps. So it has a detergent pump. Now, not all machines have that. But the detergent pump is to help wash the detergent. When, when you use powder detergent, the water temperature has to be at least 60, 70 degrees. If you're up north and you're hitting, you know, zero degrees outside, and the washer's in the basement at, at 30 degrees, the detergent will clump up and it won't dissolve well. It needs hot water to break that detergent down. That's why we recommend customers use liquid detergent over powdered detergent. But with this detergent pump, that increases the pressure trying to wash the detergent into the machine and help break that detergent down so it washes better. It's more pressure onto the compartment than just the water valve itself. So I'm not going to go over, there's a fabric softener detergent pump. I'm not going to go over them too much. But they do have these sensors. So the detergent level sensor and the water level sensor. Um, so. Let me, let me take a look and just read this now. Perform the following checks. Save the customer's detergent or softener in a spare container. When the reservoir is empty, you should hear the float moving up and down. When the reservoir is rotated, if stuck, thoroughly rinse the reservoir with warm water and fill it, fill it with water to test the floats. So if you're looking at these two devices here, the, the detergent level sensor or fabric level sensor, they have floats in them, and if we zoom in, I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit more. Those hoses go to these boxes right here, which are the pumps. But the pumps have also a switch inside of them that if there's no water, or, or not the water, but actually detergent or fabric softener in the dispenser, they won't let the pump run. The pump knows there's no detergent, no fabric softener in there. So those two switches here, uh, let me get back to the diagram. These two switches here, that's a symbol for a float switch. Uh, they're the same thing like in a float in a toilet bowl where they go up and down with what's inside the dispenser. That's just so that the machine knows whether, whether to run that detergent drain pump, I'm sorry, detergent dispenser pump or the fabric softener pump. Um, we can ohm them out from the board, and we can also check voltage at this point here from the board. Um, when will I have five volts on this to softener circuit? When what happens? When it's, when it's energizing? Not when it's energizing. Yes, it has to be energized to have five volts, but 
Diagnosis mode. That's the pill. What'd you say, Jonas? I said you would have to put in diagnosis mode in order to get a five volt DC in there. Well, it, it, it could be in the wash cycle. What'd you say, Mike, before I go over the answer? I would say it has to fill. It, it'd have to have detergent or fabric softener in the dispenser because if you look, that's just a switch. And you cannot check voltage across a switch that is closed because this is positive 5 volts DC here. Well, if it, this switch is closed, all this is is a wire and a switch. It's going to be positive DC here too. The only time you're going to read 5 volts from these two plugs or 5 volts from these two plugs is if this dispenser here is open. That switch is open. You cannot get voltage across a closed switch. And what that means is, let me show you here. I have to screenshot this. And I can get my tool to open here. Let's go to my drawing tool. move all these out of the way here. So, oh, this is the one I want. Move this out. Okay. So let's look at this detergent here. I want to check voltage. So I'm put meter lead here and meter lead here. If this switch is closed, this is all one side of the circuit. The only way you can check voltage on a circuit is there has to be a load. A load is a sensor with resistance, a load is a drain pump with resistance, or a load is a heating element. A switch is not a load. So when a switch is closed, you're going to get a zero volt reading. I don't recommend doing a voltage test across a switch because it will confuse you because all the things that we just said is I checked the drain pump for voltage. I checked the heating element for voltage. Now I'm going to go to this switch and I'm going to check voltage and it's going to say zero volts if this switch is closed. What are you going to think if your meter says zero volts? What's that going to, what's, what, what would you think if you got voltage at that point where my meter is now? The if board, component is bad? You think that, no, you think the board is not sending power. You would think the board is not sending power. Because if this switch is closed, this would be a positive 5 volt CC. This is going to be positive too. Now let's go to the diagram for a second. I'm going to go back to the very first page of the diagram, and I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to take it back to another page. Sorry, guys. So here's a diagram. I know it's not that clear. I can get a clearer one, but let me see if I can find um, the two switches, the dispenser switches. Uh, I don't see, I see door switches. I don't see the uh, dispenser switches on here. Let me go to the actual uh, chart here, see if I can find those switches on the diagram. I can find the wiring diagram. Let me get this, so this is going to be a lot clearer for you guys to see it. Let me go to the top here and see what page is the diagram. Now this manual in the first video, I put a link to the manual, so if you uh, uh, need this di wiring diagram location, component testing, wiring diagram, page 3-3 and 3-4. Okay, so here's the diagram. So 
So we got two machines here. We have a Maytag and a Whirlpool. They're the same manufacturer. I'm looking for the switches that we were just talking about. Does anybody see them on the diagram here? I see one. Y'all see it? Is it on the top left? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So here we got. We're checking this switch. <clears throat> I want to check voltage. How do I know <clears throat> if that switch is closed? I said you can't put your meter lead on these two pins, three and four, and check voltage here. Why? Because it's just a switch. So what could you do? I'm going to screenshot this because I just thought of something here. You, let me copy this. Copy, let me bring up my other program. And here it is. I want to know voltage. put my meter leads guys give me some points I go to diagnostics I went to the detergent uh, dispenser and I told it to dispense detergent and I wanted to know if this level switch was the problem or the board was the problem for my level switch how and what can I do to test it well, most people would say, well, you put one meter lead here and one meter lead here, and that's across the switch. But if the switch is closed, I get zero volts. If the switch is open, I get five. But that's not a good test. Give me someplace else. I could use other parts of the board if anybody got any ideas. I see line in neutral, so that is the first place that I'm like, maybe there. The only thing is this. <clears throat> well, I, well, I don't mean to cut you off, Mike, but neutral and line are 120 volts. We're talking yeah, about yeah, and five. five. So what can we do? I will go output and five. So I'll put, wait, I will go from 5 VDC to ground. 5 DC and ground. Where's ground? Where am I going to use ground? I'm looking above. Here? Yeah, in between there right and then there. the output. Right there. Because if that's ground, that's 5 volts DC. That's, that's ground. The 5 volts DC is the positive. This is the negative. So I can put my negative on any ground on the board. This is going to be a positive, and this is going to be a positive if this switch is closed. So watch. If I put my meter where I have them now, I can see if the board is setting voltage out to, this, to, to that switch. Then if I move my meter lead here, let's just say I got a hundred, uh, uh, 5 volts here. And I move my meter lead to this pin here, and I have 0 volts. What does that tell me? It's not receiving um, voltage. I got voltage here and here, but I don't have it where my meter leads are now. It's not getting voltage, but it's telling me more than that. Maybe you don't have... The switch is bad. The switch is bad. I got power going to the switch, but it's not coming back. I should have 5 volts here and here as well as here and here. So I don't need to ohm out the switch. Can I check that switch out for voltage? Yes. I said earlier, I don't like it if you check a switch for voltage. That's confusing. Well, if you put the red meter lead here and the black meter lead here, that's not a good test. But if I'm using ground on the board, and I can use any ground and put it here, yes, I'm going to have a positive and negative. I'm going to have 5 volts. And if the switch is good, I'll have 5 volts here. If the switch is no good, I'll have 5 volts at, at pin 4, but at pin 3, I have 0. 
Do you guys see how I'm using voltage to make that test? Yes, we I got it. Any questions on that? Uh, no, please, I don't get it. Okay, well, let's, let's just take a look at a diagram for a second. A simple diagram. Okay, uh, you got a line, a switch, a light bulb, and the other side of the circuit, right? Mm -hmm. Let, let's make this a DC circuit just for understanding, right? So this is positive, 5 volts, and this is ground. Let me get my meter lead here, because this is all about understanding circuits. If you guys need this, I'll, I'll do this again next class, where we just keep doing diagrams till you guys get comfortable with them. But if I go here, and I go here, what's my uh, voltage reading right now? It's going to be zero because you have an open line there. No, it's five volts. Where my meter lead is is where it would connect to the board or to the power supply. When we look at a diagram, we look at those two lines up there. That's power coming in. If I showed you a stove diagram, uh, hold on one second. If I showed you a stove diagram, it would be the same thing. Uh, give me one second here. I got diagrams here. Uh, let's say frigidaire range. I got a diagram right here. I'm going to open it up. Give it a second. Okay. And we're going to rotate it. Clockwise. No, I want to go kind of clockwise. But okay. So if we look at this diagram, look here. L1, L2, neutral. I put my meter lead on L1 and L2. I'm checking the power coming in. L1 and neutral. I'm checking the power coming in. L2 and neutral. I'm checking the power coming in. That's the same thing on my diagram. I'm checking the power coming in. So right here I have 5 volts. Follow me there? So we, um, you, you lost me there. So basically if you are, if you was going to check the light bulb, that's that's when you're going you're not gonna have um voltage right. there because if i put my meter here and here the answer is i don't no. have voltage okay that's exactly what i thought okay but i'm not checking that there i'm checking here and here coming in oh uh, okay gotcha okay so going back to that the dispenser circuit it's just a switch so what happens when i put my meter lead here What's my reading now? Five. Five volts. What if I put my meter lead here? Zero. Zero. Zero because the switch is open. Okay. So what if I do this? I put my meter lead back here, and I put my meter lead here at the light. What's my voltage? Five, Five volts. Volt. Five volts. Very good. What if I go to the other side of the bulb? Zero. Zero. It'll be still five. No, no, five, 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 five. Why five. is it five? You guys are correct. Why is it five? Because the ground is still connected to the load. Wait, wait, wait. Mike first, because Mike spoke first. Go ahead, Mike. Because the ground is still coming through the actual load. Yes. What were you saying, Jonas? That's exactly what I was going to say as well. So the filament in the bulb, it's not glowing and not gliding, but it is providing a path. We call this potential voltage. There's voltage there in the diagram, but there's no current flowing and the light's not working. So let me ask you a question. If I put my meter lead here, what's my voltage reading? Five. Still gonna have five because you still have the path. Correct. What about here? You still gonna have it. Five. Five. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more thing now. I'm going to erase my switch and I'm going to put two black dots just to show where the switch is. It was supposed to be black here, but here and here. And then I'm going to draw another switch. But I'm going to close the switch now. 
Okay, let's do those same tests over again. Voltage here and here. Zero. No, sir. That's it's five because it, it's, it's five because three. it's like a wire being able to allow the, the current to come through. Now, remember, we're not measuring current. We're measuring voltage. And even in your wall, you've got two prongs. You've got line one and neutral. It was the same with DC. We got a positive five and a negative ground. So I'm going to have potential voltage there all the time. Now, I'm not talking about that switch on the, on the washing machine where it has to be on. I'm talking about this circuit right here. What if I move this meter lead to here? Still the same. You're still going to have five volts. Still going to have five volts. What if I put it to here? Yes. Yes, what? No. No, you won't have it there, really. Because... I had it before. Because the switch is closed, it becomes, I guess, a line, um, like a wire. Because this switch is closed, this positive 5 is going to go all the way up to here. When the switch is closed and the circuit is complete, I was going to bring the 5 over. I could do it. But we got plus 5 here. And we have ground here. So, if I had this meter lead here and this meter on the switch and it was closed, I'm going to get 0 volts. You say, but yeah, but I got 5 volts here. Yeah, but in order for the meter to read it, it has to be on the other side. Your meter, guys, is the same thing as a light bulb. It needs two wires, one to bring power in and one to take power out. What if I did this? I took and ran a wire from here to here on that light bulb. What would happen? I think the light bulb should still function. It will not. No. You create a short there, Rick. I create a short. Mm, now nice. look, here's a series circuit. One light bulb, another light bulb, and out. We have plus five here, and we have ground here. I'm just going to put a G because I can't write too good with this. So if I put my meter here, and here, I have 5 volts. If I go here and here, I have 5 volts. What if I put my meter here? <laughs> you don't get nothing. Now you just like you become... Actually, you have 2.5 volts. Uh, oh, 2.5. Okay. Why? Because... Oh, you split it. The whole circuit is five, and if the two light bulbs are the same exact bulb, they share the voltage 50-50. So each one's getting two and a half volts. They're not glowing as bright. The current's flowing through. So this centerpiece is neither positive nor the negative, because if I put my meter lead here and this one here, I'm going to have 2.5. So now let's go to, like, if I ran this wire here, if I ran a wire across here, it would be the same as if I ran a switch and I closed it and I ran that to here. What would happen? I'm going to call this light bulb A and this light bulb B. What happens in this circuit? It looks like a shunt, so it would actually just bypass A and go to B. That's correct. But how do you explain it so someone will understand why it will bypass it? Because I still see a circuit for electricity to travel. You're right with the term shunt. You're right it won't work. But how do you explain it to someone who doesn't understand it? That it's going to have a different function time than B would. Well, what if I did this? I'm going to erase this so I can capture that plus five. Uh, here. What do I have right here? Do I have positive, negative, or neither? Positive.
positive or graph? Positive. It's continuation of this, right? So I have, mm -hmm. Oops. So, oh, sorry guys, it's been a while since I used this tool here. So, I got positive 5 here, right? Mm -hmm. What do I have at this switch right here? Positive, ground, or neither? Neither. It's positive five. It's an extension. Positive. Right? It's the extension of the first one, yeah. It's just a piece of wire. If you went to an outlet like this, I have it from a previous lecture. If I have an electrical outlet and that small one is power, um, if I stuck my finger inside that little hole, I got to get shocked, right? What if I added a piece of wire, stuck a piece of wire in here, ran it all the way to here? If I touch the end of this wire, am I going to get shocked? Yep. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's a piece of metal that's going to carry the voltage. So if we go back to this diagram of the light bulb, this is just a wire carrying voltage. This is just a wire carrying voltage. I'm going to have plus five there. So I'm at plus five here. So what am I going to have on the other side of my switch? Positive, negative, or ground? Ground. Ground? Well, didn't I say we're not going to have ground between A and B? So basically, the, the continuity of the five is still going to go because um, it's still like the switch uh, is still like a fuse. If the switch is closed, yeah. it's, it's five volts there, right? It's still positive five. Right. All of All this right. is just an extension of this. So, what is it here? What is it right here? On the other side of bulb A. It's plus five. This is all an extension of the plus five, all of it. And my ground is where my black meter lead is, right? But my plus five is here now. Am I gonna have A working with two positives and no ground? We said that, I said at the beginning, in order for a load to work, I have to have line one and neutral or positive and ground. And light bulb A, if we looked at the diagram that we just said, it's positive on one side of the bulb and positive on the other side of the bulb. If it's positive on both sides, the bulb's not going to work. That is an explanation of why doesn't the bulb work when the switch is closed. Because all the switch does is it carries the positive over to the other side. Now the bulb has two positives. But once I open that switch, this five disappears, this five disappears, and this five disappears. This wire here is an extension of this. So your ground is where the black meter lead is. Your positive is where the red meter lead is. But this is in between. When electricity flows through a circuit and it sees both light bulb A and B, it does not know hey, I got two light bulbs, I gotta go through two. It looks at it as one big bulb. Because if we were to measure ohms on this circuit, and let's just say this bulb was 20 ohms, let's just say this is 20, and this is 20, what's my resistance with this circuit? 40. 40. 40. So, the bulb looks at it as one 
load. It doesn't know that there's a piece of wire in between. It just knows it has to force electricity through 40 ohms and not 20 ohms. And when I close this switch, if I measure ohms here and here, what's my total resistance? 40? It's 20. It'll be 20. It's only 20 because just like electricity, the meter uses a battery that will force current through this bulb to get a reading. And this bulb will not work. So that's why when Mike said there's a shunt, that's what that does. It bypasses that circuit. We have a lot of appliances that use that circuit. We have dryers. The, the, the buzzer on the dryer uses that circuit. Um, we have, uh, yeah, I can't think of it without bringing up diagrams. We have diagrams that use this circuit. Okay, the push to start switch on a dryer sometimes uses that circuit. So these different things here are that circuit. So going back to this switch, that's why we want to put one meter lead here and use the ground over here for voltage. And I jump over, if I don't have voltage, my switch is bad. If I do have voltage, then I know my board is doing what it's supposed to do and my dispenser switch is working. Any questions on that, guys? All right, let me just, we're running up on the hour. Let me just go through the manual real quick and see if there's anything else important on this diagram that I want to show you. Here's the washer manual. And let me go back to the components. Okay, so here's the motor. Here you can't really check voltage. This one here, you can ohm out the motor. And if you look, we have between pin one and two, we have between six and 20 ohms. Let's just say I get eight ohms. Is that a good reading? Yes. Yes. So if I check between two and three, what reading should I get? Between six and 20. Between six and 20. Well, how about one and three? Between six and 20. Now on these motors, they call them three phase because each winding here works in a different phase. So when we measure one, one of them, all three of them should read the same resistance value. If I said that these are eight ohm of readings, and let me go ahead and screenshot this because I want to show you something. Let's see if I can trick you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how, how much attention you guys are paying here. Here, and I'll bring the meter lead in for a second. And let me go back to one page. All right, so I put one meter lead here and one meter lead here. I'm checking, and my meter tells me I have... 8 ohms of resistance from here to here. Now, if I test the other windings, and I'm going to use a different color for each one, I test from here to here, I should get the same reading of 8 ohms. And then if I move my meter lead here to here, I should have 8 ohms. Let me uh, pick a different color here. 8 ohms from this one to this one. So I got a question. 
There's how many windings do you see in this in this motor? Three. What's the Three. resistance value of each winding? That's a trick. Six to twenty. No. Six to twenty. No, I told you I got an eight ohm reading with my meter. It's something you got to think about. Divide it it by three. No, because when I'm doing this test, how many windings am I actually going through? You you're checking all three of them together. No, but between one and three. Yes. Uh, you're checking two. I'm checking two. I'm checking yeah. this one and this one, right? Yes. So I have four ohms here. I have four ohms here. And I have four ohms here. So if I put mm -hmm. a meter lead here and here, it goes through this one and this one. It goes through this one and this one, and I'm getting eight. If I go yes. here and here, I'm going through this one and this one, I get eight. You get eight. Exactly. So no matter which two I'm testing, I'm actually checking two of the three windings. I'm not checking one. But they should all read the same resistance. So what's the point? You go to a customer's washing machine that fills up a water, and the motor's not running. Well, there's no voltage. If we went back to the manual and looked at the manual for testing this motor, it's going to tell you how to test it. Okay? And what are they telling you here? Check the motor windings, disconnect the harness, and check for ohms on those windings. Now, if you have those, that resistance on those motors, all three of them read the same, you have to assume the windings in your motor are good and the problem is elsewhere. And in this case, if you watch the video that I showed you, this part of the main board here was your motor controller circuit. The main board and the motor control board are all on one control board. So you just change the board if the motor's not running. We cannot check voltages because the voltages on this motor varies with speed. You don't know at any given point should I have 200 volts, should I have 100 volts, or so, so forth. They're not giving that to you in, in, in the diagnostics, and they're not giving it to you on the schematic. They're just saying it's connected to the board. So. We need to ohm it out. If it ohms out and the motor's not running, the problem's on board. This is one that I, I'm not going to tell you. You know what? We're not going to do an ohms. Uh, I mean, a voltage test on this one because you can't. On a refrigerator, what is similar to this? Yeah, compressor. What type of compressor? A VCC compressor. An inverted compressor. Yeah. You know what? An inverted <laughs> compressor. The windings are in the same configuration, and they should all read the same. So checking out that motor and checking out that compressor, we use the same steps. If the if inverted compressor don't work, we check the, the compressor, and if all three windings check good, most likely my inverter board is bad. In this case, the inverter board is part of the main board. If the inverter board is separate, one second. Um, I'm looking for something here. Give me a second here. I got it. Let me get a picture. So here's an inverter board. The inverter board on, on our washer is, is on a machine, but on a compressor inverter board, you're going to have three plugs. You're going to have one plug, and you see this in black and white, it's 120 all the time. You got a low voltage communication plug that goes to the main board. That's usually like 12 volts DC, and that's the main board telling this board, hey, turn the compressor on. This has 120 volts all the time. And there's another plug right there, you can't really see it, and that's the one that plugs right on the compressor. So in a, in a washer, 
We can't separate the inverter board and check input power. It's on the main board. So if it fills up with water and the motor don't run, we ohm the windings out. We can ohm them from the control board. And it should have three identical readings. If they check good, I change the board. But on a compressor, whose similar properties of, of you know, motor control and, and, and motor, we check input voltage here. If we have input voltage and the compressor don't run, change the inverter, as long as the resistance is okay. Any questions on that? Yes, I have a question. Wait. Sure. Um, can, can the compressor um, be grounded and then you still have the check, um, the resistance check okay? If a compressor is grounded, that means one of these wires burned and touched mm -hmm. the metal frame of the machine. Yes. That will cause a resistance value change. So you may get eight when you check these two, but when you check these two, you're going to get three and one. So you okay. don't have three same readings if you have a ground or a short. Okay. And that's the same with the washing machine motor. This motor is one of the big round ceiling fan motors, but a lot of the newer washers use this type of motor wiring circuit. So if you know how the wiring goes, you should be able to check it out. Now, let me just see one more thing, if there's anything else. I went over the door lock assembly in the first class. Um, the drum light, I'm not going to go over a light bulb. Water valve, I think you guys are pretty good with water valves. I'm not going to... Uh, spend a lot of time. We talked about the pressure switch in the last class. We talked about the drain pump, the heater. I think we covered all the components mainly in the washer. Remember, an appliance is filled with a lot of parts. Every one of those parts in the machine have their own individual circuit. Why? Because if we go back, let's go back to the diagram of this machine here. It was a 3-3. these components, if you look, have their own circuit, has its own circuit, has its own circuit, has its own circuit. The main reason we do that is so we can control each one of them separately. Like an example, four burners on the stove. When you're cooking, you don't want to turn on all four at one time. You want to turn on the left front, the right front, the right rear. So each one of them have their own control to turn them on and off. And each one has its own circuit. Well, that's the same thing with any appliance. Each one of these parts have their own circuit, and they come off the board, and the board controls them. So when you're troubleshooting, going back to the basics, identify what the problem is. Identify the circuit, let's say like this fan circuit. All right? Identify the voltage. How much voltage goes to that fan motor? I cannot see it. I don't know. Maybe 12 or DC. How, what do I have highlighted? Oh, line neutral. So that's how much voltage. Oh. Right. Oh, by the way, I found out the detergent level switch was over here. Um, that's 120 volts. This is 120 volts. This is 120, unless they specify ground, DC, v, DC, VDC, line neutral, 120 volts, 120 volts. So each one is its own circuit. So when we troubleshoot, we try to narrow it down just to the circuit that's not working and only check the parts that's in that circuit. I hope that makes sense. Yes, sir. Got it. Any other questions before we go for today? Because it's 1.15 already. We normally go about an hour. But I don't mind answering any questions you guys have. If it's not about the washer, it could be about anything appliance related if you want to ask. All right, we can have a question. Sure. Thank you. Um, I have a question about a compressor. Um, can I come a 3-in-1 burn a compressor? Yes.
think that Brandon and I were talking about one of those the other day. Uh, someone had a question about a three-in-one kit. Let me um, let me bring up this three-in-one kit here and show you guys something. Okay, here's a three-in-one kit. Okay, if we look at it. It says RCO410 relay capacitor overload. 410 is the model. The important thing is quarter and one-third horsepower. That means it is rated for a compressor that is either a quarter horsepower or one-third horsepower. Now, they do have other three-in-ones. That was an RCO410. Let me see something here. RCO, I think, 310. Give me a second here to bring the 310. I want to find that for you here. Okay, so this is, no, that's 410. I, I typed 310 and it came up 410. Uh -huh. But they have different 3-in-1 kits rated for different... Um, Compressor horsepower. Does anybody know why? Because if the I believe if the horsepower is higher than this one, that can create the problem. But how does it create a problem? That's if you look at here. Here they have the URC. O210, which is half horsepower, 410, which is quarter to one third horsepower, 810 is one twelfth to one fifth horsepower. So they put a check mark, so this is the quarter to one third horsepower, but they have three different ones the 210, the 410, and the 810. The thing is, is that the relay part of it is a PTC relay. When current flows through it, it gets hot. The resistance value of that part goes up and it disconnects the start winding from the circuit. If we don't disconnect the start winding from the circuit, we'll burn up the uh, winding in the compressor. So this goes back to Jonas, what your question was, um, you know, will it burn up a compressor? Well, it obviously will burn up a compressor if you have the wrong relay connected to the compressor. You, let's say you have a quarter horsepower compressor, but you have a one-eighth horsepower compressor, which requires the, this one and not the top one. Well, it may take the start winding out or drop the voltage to it some, but there's still current going through it, and it's going to burn out the winding in your compressor. So a lot of refrigerators do not tell you what your horsepower rating is. How do we figure that out? How do I know what the horsepower rating is on the compressor? Um, maybe like um, the um, the data sheet, maybe you might have to look there. Okay. Not all manufacturers are going to. But let, let me just uh, bring this page over here. It says, how do we determine horsepower rating a compressor? We need to multiply the kilowatt by the motor efficiency and then convert to HP. An example, 100 horsepower motor, 95% efficiency would need input kilowatt of 78. The motor efficiency rate is 7. Is that going to explain to you what the heck's going on? No. So you could... Measure the ohms, determine the voltage, and figure out the amperage. And by then, you can figure out the wattage that that compressor runs and convert wattage to horsepower because wattage is basically horsepower. So it's going to be hard because it, it isn't straight up math. Because you see here, they're talking about efficiency and kilowatts, which is thousands of a watt. Um, you need to know which one is going to do. So I have three and ones in my compressor, uh, in my, in my 
my technician's trucks. So if they run across a bad relay or a compressor is not working, and they say, well, how do I know if it's a relay or the compressor? The relay don't check good, but I don't want to order a relay and come back here and find out the compressor is not working. So I tell my guys, go ahead and install the 410, and if the compressor runs, leave it on the refrigerator, but order the factory relay and overload. Do not leave these on there, even if they match the horsepower rating. I have seen customers compressors burn up after being used with the 3-in-1 kit. Does it mean the 3-in-1 kit caused it? Not necessarily. It may have been uh, going bad because the relay went bad and the compressor couldn't start till you got there and was slowly burning it up. But um, you can leave it on there and order the right relay and overload and come back and replace them with the proper component. That's my right. recommendation. Okay? I feel I feel guilty. I feel like sometimes some type of guilt. I should, um like I went to a call about a month and a half ago. Um they have like um a GE refrigerator then he has the relay went bad on it. I put a three oh one on it, but it seems like I got a call back within a month of 45 days. I went, there <laughs> I went there yesterday. The composer, um, homes, okay, it's continued to everything. But when I check it, the ground is grounded. So, and that uh, probably happened if it wasn't sized for the right compressor and it burned the winding over a period of time. I told the customer he was you know, the composer was on his last leg because when I was there, the amperage of it was two ohms, um, two amp. Well, what you could do is, is tell the customer, listen, I could probably get this compressor running with a three-in-one kit, but because your relay went bad or whatever, your compressor may need to be replaced. This is not a permanent fix. If you want, I put the three-in-one kit here. The refrigerator is running. I cannot guarantee how long it would last. If I was to order a compressor, this is what I would charge to install the compressor. If I put the three-in-one kit now, maybe I give you a discount if it fails within 90 days. But after 90 days, if the compressor fails, you have to pay the full full cost. You know? Well, I didn't communicate that to the customer well enough. Um, I don't know, but because the fridge was like, um, was um, in the storage for a couple months before I even moved to Florida. So therefore, um, it probably um, sitting on the warehouse, wherever they store it before they move it in. That's how there was like both fan, um, evaporator fan was fell on that fridge as well. Yeah, but you don't know if that compressor was even working before they brought it to the home. Uh, that's exactly, I don't know. I I don't know. So, uh, well, that's the only thing I could recommend. Uh, anything else, guys? Any, any of you guys have any questions before we uh, tighten up? I got a quick question. Sure. I had a um, water dispenser, um, ice maker, wasn't working. Mm -hmm. um, checked it for water. Water came through the water filter. And... Um, the motors work because I heard it. Well, I'm sorry? Be a little bit more specific. Working through the water filter means what? Um, the water wipe, press the two, um, took out the water filter, press the two uh, knobs in the water filter, and the water came out. So I conclude it wasn't frozen in the water lines. Um, replaced the um, water valve, and then the water dispenser came on. I mean, the, the water started to flow with the water dispenser. So I told the customer that um, just give it some time and the the ice uh, maker will start making ice. So I got a call, uh, text saying that um, the ice maker is not working. It's not getting ice. So I'm saying either it was turn off. This is my conclusion. Tell me if I'm wrong. Either the controls, you turn the control off for the ice maker or the um, um, got the other thing I was thinking. What brand is this, Peter? 
Yeah, I mean, to me, that's the only conclusion. It's a um, electrolux. Okay. So you know that if they have a filter inside, they have two sets of water valves, one before the filter and one that's after it. the filter. The reason why they do that is so that the customer can change the water filter without having to pull the fridge out, shut the water off behind the behind the fridge. Okay, so okay. if you think the ice, if the filter was bad, you wouldn't have water coming out the door, which you said you got water coming out the door. But it's not going up to the ice maker. Correct. So on the ice maker, which type of ice maker was it? Was it the the eight cavity, like the half moon shape or the plastic tray, um, which uh, ice maker was it? Um, trying to remember. Because if it was the flex tray. Say that again. Was it the flex tray, like the plastic oh. tray ice maker? Or the... I believe so. Okay, because at that point I would go to diagnostics, and I would, I would force the water to go into the ice maker through diagnostics. Okay. I would put my voltmeter on the first water valve. Well, wait a minute now. On 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 the first water valve is not a problem because the first water valve, um, you said the water in the door is working, so the first water valve is before the filter. Now the second water valve is the one that tells it after it comes out the filter, is it going to go to the ice maker or is it going to go to the door? All right. So it comes in one water valve, flows to the uh, filter. If you guys give me one second, I'll bring up something here. I think I have something here on under my appliance books and modules, refrigerators. Let me look at Maytag refrigerator. Um, let me just see something here. You did have three valves, the lower valve, three separate ones, all combined. Okay, it's not, okay, so look, look, look at this picture here. So in a typical ice maker, water goes into the water valve, goes through the filter, and into the ice maker. If you look here, we got two water valves. The water comes in, that water goes mm -hmm. to the filter. And if when a filter mm -hmm. goes back to another water valve, that water valve shoots up to the ice maker or shoots water to the door. It goes to a tank in the refrigerator that stores the water to get it cold and it goes to the door. So what I want to do is I want to check this valve here and I want to put my voltmeter on the second valve. And I want to go to diagnostics and see if that valve is energized to bring water to my ice maker. If that is, the next thing I want to do is I want to take the hose off of the water valve, put the water valve over a container, and see if water shoots out this valve. Now, is water coming in this valve? Yes or no? Okay, um, the only water valves that I was aware of, there were three separate at the, in the back of the fridge. Yeah, one coming in instead of double, and then two going out, like the one on the right here. One in and two out. So when you look at the water valve, you'll see three solenoids. They're just drawing the two of them separately. Okay, yes. But here's your three solenoids. Right, right. But the my three. question was, right, is right, water right. coming into here? And the answer is yes. Why? Because on the water on the door, it goes here, right? So what I tell people is like, hmm, I, I don't know how to go into diagnostics on this refrigerator. I'm not going to be able to put it in the diagnostics. Watch this. I'm going to show you something here. I know I'm going way over time here, guys, but I don't mind doing this. Edit, copy. Watch this. So here it is right here, and I know water's coming in here because it's going out to the door. So I want to know if water's coming mm -hmm. to the ice maker. Well, it could be a voltage problem. Okay. It could be a solenoid problem. But in order for water to go to the ice maker, I have to energize 
the valve on the left and this valve. They both have to be on. Now, what if I took the plug, and I'm just going to, you know, there's a plug on this solenoid here, and there's a plug on this solenoid here. What if I swapped the plug? What if I took this plug and put it on this one here? What would that do for me if I disconnected this plug from the water side and put it on the, on the ice maker side? What would happen? What do I have to do? How could I use it? It's going to energize the ice maker, the water going to the ice maker. When? What? When when you um try to uh, put a test on the ice maker to see if it works. No. What I'm saying is that you don't know how to do diagnostics, for example. If you unplug the water on the door and you move that plug to the ice maker side and you go over I got it and push on it, instead of sending power to this solenoid, it's going to send power to that solenoid, and where's the water going to go? Gone to the ice maker. Got the it. Ice maker. still don't get water. Ice maker, well, hmm. Most likely this it's valve. Is water. Okay, but well, I replaced the valve, though. It's a brand new water valve. Well, you, did you check voltage to it? Because what if it's frozen right here at the delivery tube where it goes through the wall? The biggest problem we have on refrigerators, believe it or not, is ice makers and dispensers. They are our number one problem, besides compressors on some brands. But um, if a water valve gets debris inside of it, when it goes to shut off, like you use the water and then you turn it off, if a little mm -hmm. bit of debris gets inside that rubber disc on that valve, the valve mm -hmm. won't seat and it'll cause water to drip into the ice maker. And that dripping will cause your delivery tube to freeze up. So how would you know if the water valve's good? If I took this hose off of the valve and I switched the plug over here, I should see water coming out of it. If I don't right. see water coming out of it, then I know my problem's here back. But if I see water coming out of right. it, I know it's this hose to the ice maker, and most likely it's frozen in the wall where I can't see it. Right. But doesn't it go the but but if that okay. But if there's water coming through the water filter though. Yeah, but water would, would that water mean that this it's not frozen? And it goes to here, but the water filter's in the fridge. This is in this is in the, the top of the freezer where the ice maker is. Okay. So it'll freeze, but the water on the door, it, it's not going to freeze because it's not subjected to that temperature. Except for GEs. <laughs> they have the water freeze on the side by sides all the time. <laughs> and that's the hose in the okay, door. So it's okay. So if it's frozen, you basically have to um, either turn the temperature down or, or um, unplug the refrigerator, correct? Well, I do know I think Electrolux has a kit. It's like a little bit of an electric heating element and insulation that goes around this delivery tube mm -hmm. and plugs in somewhere up in the ice maker compartment that adds a little bit of heat to this tube so it does not freeze. But if it usually freezes, okay. it's usually because the water valve doesn't shut off completely and it drips a little bit because it's got debris in it, and that will also mm -hmm. cause freezing. Okay. So okay. sometimes it's the valve when it freezes up. Sometimes it's just the design. And like I said, I think Electrolux has a repair. Uh, it's a, a a delivery tube heater kit. Hold on a second. This might be it here, this first one on the left. Let me see if this is it. Dispenser. Take a picture here. Of that. That's a dispenser, but I think that piece is not clear. It looks like the delivery tube with the heater around it. 
So they don't say what that is. Let me see if I can find another one. Defrost heater kit. No, I, I, I don't see it here. Ice maker fill tube heater. So Place the dispenser ice maker fill tube. Icebox fascia and icebox assembly. That looks like a first. A we need some force. Similar thing. There are three locking. So I'm just gonna go real fast to show you what the, what, what I'm talking about with the kit. Phaser to install the heater, align the tape. So this wraps around that tube and applies heat to it to prevent it from freezing up. So you might have needed that. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Well, uh, we went over a little bit, but I don't mind. Uh, appreciate you coming, and I'll go ahead and post this on the website. I'll, I'll put it in the paid side as well as the free side. But the next class will probably be Brandon and I. I gave Brandon a little bit of time off and told him, you know, enjoy the weekend, and I'll do the class. I don't mind doing it. And uh, hope you guys have a good weekend. All right, thank you. You within a week. You guys be safe out there. Okay, take care. Bye-bye, guys. All right, see you.